let uh, Sarah take it away. All right, so welcome everyone. Welcome to our Kaleidoscope Talk, uh, the Color Research Society of Canada. My name is Robin Kingsborough, and I'm the president of the CRSC. First of all, I would like to please invite you to turn off your microphones. Please make sure you're muted through the talk. Um, you can leave your cameras on or off as you uh, wish. And after the talk, we'll invite you to turn your camera on. So if you want to ask questions. Um, I'd like to uh, say that the CRC's activities related to sharing color knowledge take place across Canada, understood as part of Turtle Island the ancestral homelands of over 630 First Nation communities, representing more than 50 Indigenous nations and languages. We work to respect, affirm, and support where necessary the inherent treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across these lands and waters. Our commitment to honouring the knowledge, ways of knowing, and wisdom of Turtle Island's Indigenous peoples aims to contribute to the decolonizing work required today for moving toward a just society. And just a little bit about the CRSC, Colour Research Society of Canada. We are a non-profit organization for colour research focused on fostering a cross-disciplinary uh, sharing of colour knowledge. We seek to develop and support a national cross-disciplinary network of artists and designers, scholars and practitioners with an interest and engagement with colour and to encourage discourse between art, sciences and industry related to colour research and knowledge. We are the Canadian member of the AIC, the International Colour Association. So I invite um, Sarah, who is one of our CRSC board members, uh, and she will introduce Rebecca. And then following that, we will, uh, after Rebecca's talk, we'll have time for a question and answer. So uh, thank you, Sarah. Please take it away. Thanks, Robin. Um, I, I, I'm in my studio and I'm wearing my studio rags, but I'm also wearing a beautiful necklace by Rebecca. And I have to say, I'm so excited for tonight's talk. Um, not only do I love Rebecca's work, which I absolutely do, but I've also um, been the lucky recipient of pictures that Rebecca has sent from her various travels. And just the way she sees color and color and texture together is just magical. So I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about this. But for those of you that don't know Rebecca, um, Rebecca um, is the an associate professor of jewelry at NASCAD and co-director of the Sandra Alfoldi um, Craft Institute at the university. She graduated in 2005 with an M MFA from the Akademie der Bildenden Künste in Munich and a BFA in 1995 from the Rhode Island School of Art and Design. She has exhibited her work internationally, presented papers internationally, um, and uh, been an attendant at many, many residencies internationally, and is the recipient of numerous grants and awards, including the North American Society of Goldsmiths Mid-Career Artist Scholarship in 2015, and a SHIRT grant um, recently um, through NASCAD in 2018. For me, um, the hallmarks of Rebecca's work are multiple. One is its playfulness, coupled with a very wry and thoughtful consideration of ideas around adornment, um, the body, the, 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 the history of jewelry and the present moment. I'm always surprised and intrigued by the way she creates form. It's so precise, it's so complex. And at the same time, it seems effortless, like it was always going to be that shape. And I'm always engaged with the humor that I, I feel is present in so much of what she does and often present in the work. And above all her work, and I'd say pretty much all aspects of Rebecca's being as I know it is deeply concerned with color and color relationships. So um, I'm just so excited and happy to introduce Rebecca. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I really appreciate uh, Sarah inviting me and sort of shepherding me through the um, the process of giving this lecture for the Color Research Society of Canada. Um, and uh, I'm so happy to kind of enter like a, a family of, of uh, color appreciators and color researchers 
even when I was like making sure I spelled Color Research Society of Canada, um, I noticed it had a U, like the color, like the British way. And uh, when I see that, it just, it makes me so happy that I've been able to build my life in Canada and Mi'kmaq in particular. So that's where I live now. I lived here and been a guest here for 14 years. This is the ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, so Sarah and I are calling in from here. So thank you for allowing me to join your color family. And uh, this talk was really fun to put together because I usually do a jewelry artist talk. And a lot of times I feel like a, like an interloper or like I'm always applying for an artist residency that's kind of, I'm not the right person, but I like make it work. So to hop into color tonight um, is making me really happy. Now I saw my sister posted like, watch Rebecca's talk tonight. She's like, she wears the most color. She's like the most colorful person I know. And I hadn't even thought about that. I, I thought of my work and color in my work, but um, you know what I do because we're just on zoom. I'll just say, I do wear a lot of color. I teach it in art school. So I'm like leaning into being just like the weird art teacher to give the kids something to talk about. And I really do experience a lot of joy um, seeing color in landscape, wearing color. Like this is my sister and myself in Palm Springs. We brought a bunch of like silly outfits to kind of interact with the mid-century modern architecture there. And uh, I had the opportunity during to spend my sabbatical in India. This was a couple of years ago. And um, I really that was just such an amazing color their uh, country there's um the women are so beautifully dressed um so expressive like no khakis and blue shirt it's just like color all the time and uh that was uh, a very special place to be present in for a couple of months and other things that i'm i'm sort of passionate about related to color um I really love found objects. I do love to travel a lot. Um, I'll always go to cemeteries and I'll go to flea markets when I go to a new country because I'm really interested in what people save rather than what gets thrown away, sort of what people deem valuable enough to keep. Um, and the other reason why I like um, I like um, sort of object crafted objects is um, they just really show like the utilitarity utilitarian like sort of everyday pragmatic qualities of like sort of humans making things and I also really like sort of enigmatic objects and objects that like in kind of an era of divisive divisiveness oftentimes you know, you'll, you'll be at an auction or a flea market and you'll kind of find this object and different kinds of people will lean in and like try to figure out like what, what is that object? Like what was its purpose? What was it for? So um, that's a, just a little bit why I love craft and um, crafted objects and like the power that making and craft has to connect people. So a little, a tiny bit of my background, I've always worked in a two-dimensional way. I've done a lot of printmaking and uh, kind of, I work in a two-dimensional way in my journal and do collage and things like that to this day as a way to kind of generate ideas. Um, but I am trained as a goldsmith and I worked for a number of years in New York City as a goldsmith. And then like Sarah said, I did my grad school in Germany not too much color there yet. <laughs> this part I get to glaze over because it's not a um, a jewelry talk. Um, but very interested in form, less about color. Um, when I was done with grad school, um, I moved with my husband back to upstate. And I just worked in my own uh, jewelry workshop and I 
remember I had an exhibition that was entitled Nest and I was kind of nesting then. And uh, I uh, made, I was like, I'm going to make a show where everything's black and white. You know, I'm, I've always been interested in like unique materials. Like this is a half egg shell that I sort of claw set like a Tiffany setting and that's horse hair with a black patina. Um, so I was like, okay, this show is going to be all black and white. Oh yeah. It was called black and white and red all over, but you know, like 80% of the way in, I just like, I had to bring like a little bit of color into this show and uh, oh, I see this is in the wrong order. Um, so I did start to kind of like um, incorporate found objects. So it was black and white and then some red and then some other colors um and in addition to like the years we lived in upstate new york um i was working with a lot of formica laminates so um these were all hand cut with my jeweler saw um if you don't know what formica laminate is these are were like chips i pulled from my husband's architecture firm so they're sort of um really strong, durable, long wearing plastic that, you know, you can use on your countertop in the kitchen or the bathroom. And I used to kind of like grab the chips from his office because they would be replaced and I would cut them by hand. And I would say in those years, my work, it was colorful, um, but it was very two dimensional. So it had more of a, a relationship to printmaking and kind of color exploration. And at some point, I applied for a job at uh, Nova Scotia College of Design University, and I got it. Um, so it was kind of unique. I was not uh, hired to teach in the jewelry department. I was hired to teach in the foundation year. So uh, this was kind of cool. Like as a jeweler, I thought, you know, who teaches those classes like sculptors, painters, but I got the job, so I was thought, okay, they're entrusting me to do this. And then they said, which classes do you wanna teach? We have 3D classes, we have color theory. And I was like, this is amazing because I had been on the um, jewelry pathway for so long. Like RISD was like, you pick jewelry, no more choices. Worked in New York City as a jeweler, 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 Germany, jeweler. So then I could kind of remember like the Bauhaus principles or like how Alexander Calder like took a spool of wire and like got on a ship to cross the ocean with a pair, pair of pliers. And um, so they tasked me with teaching color theory classes. And so I was in my first year, I was staying one, you know, one week ahead of the student, like boning up on my color theory. And I remember when I first looked at a color wheel, I've always loved orange, like orange is, for some reason, I'm, I'm very attracted to orange. And then I like things that go with orange, but I thought for sure that green was the complement of orange. So in my mind, green is the color that makes orange the most orange. And then I looked at the color wheel and I was wrong. Like blue is the complement of orange. So they're the complements are across from each other on the color wheel. And that really surprised me. And the more I studied uh, color theory, you know, there's there's analogous colors, there's triadic, you know, color families. And um, this was like, I don't know, it kind of like broke my world open. It was so kind of counter to the world of jewelry making. And I, I love that colors have a specific scientific kind of perceptual relationship to each other. So these are triadic color families. So, you know, and then I was teaching this to students like, you know, okay, these are the families and like perception is a little bit elusive. It's like memory plus what you're seeing. And uh, then once I knew that there were color rules, I'm like, oh, you can break the color rules. So something that has always really appealed to me is Memphis Design. So this, or Memphis Group, Memphis Design. So this was sort of an movement started by a Tori Sapsas. And it was uh, 
it was like really popular in the the 80s and uh it's very polarizing like people either like hate memphis design or they love it but i'm like oh all these color families are all wrong there's like a tint in there with some white and then triadic and just like the colors are are jarring and uh i just thought that's really exciting that you can both play with relationships and then you can also break that relationship so at the same time i was like boning up, up on my color theory um you know i was new in nova scotia so i was going to all the museums here and i went to the art gallery nova scotia here in halifax and at that time this painting was up in the gallery so you know how when you get caught in the back of the art museum and you find yourself in like the maritime like harbor scene painting it's like they're usually pretty dry you know so when I uh, got into this room of like you know sort of normal like maritime uh, uh, paintings this painting was there and I thought oh is this like a museum intervention like this is like looks kind of like a Russian constructivist painting like but also like a very normal harbor scene and doing a little bit of research it turned out it was uh, painted by Arthur Lismer um, and this was a dazzle camouflage ship that was in our harbor and he was one of the principals of the university that I teach at um, and uh, did some documenting during the Halifax explosion and Anyway, this was my gateway into, um, can you guys hear my dog barking really loud? You don't hear that? Okay, thank goodness, okay. Um, so this was my in way into Dazzle Camouflage, but um, I didn't find that much information about Dazzle Camouflage back then um, until one, one night I was like in a downward Google spiral and <laughs> I somehow found um, these two books, they're about camouflage and about dazzle camouflage, and uh, they are written by Roy, Roy Behrens, who he's a professor at the University of Iowa, and he has dedicated his life to the study of camouflage. Not only that, like when I put these books in my basket <laughs> at like one in the morning on Amazon and I ordered them, by the morning, he had personally written me. He's like, hello, I see that you have ordered my self-published books. Um, I see that you studied at Rhode Island School of Design. I want to let you know that in the archives of RISD is like one of the most wholesome collections of dazzle camouflage designs that an American donated, you know, a GI who came back from the war. And they were about to be thrown away, but a, um, a librarian there somehow knew what they were. Anyway, next time you're at RISD, you can uh, go study those. So he, he had done an even later night Google a search of me, but these books are um, pretty amazing. Um, not only that, but Roy has a, a blog called Camo. I look at this is like furs camo it's just it's completely fulsome and absolutely fascinating so um reading his blog sort of turned me on to uh different aspects of camouflage like um like theories of counter shading and disruptive patterning um there's some debate who kind of originated ideas of camouflage but I'll just say that Abbott Henderson Thayer first identified some of these ideas of camouflaging into nature or, you know, there's images of like prey birds being uh, white from the underside in case predators are looking up or um, dark from the top, depending on sort of their environment and, and where a predator is viewing them. And then that sort of like, I went down that Google spiral to um, masquerade, mimicry, um, conceal and reveal and kind of warning coloration in nature. So because I've kind of, I'm kind of interested in like meaningful color patterns and color relationships, 
Um, I really like things like this, like this is um, one snake is poisonous and then the other snake is not poisonous, but he wants to, but he tries to look at like the poisonous one. So there's a song that goes with this. It's just like red after yellow, kill a fellow, red after black, venom lack. So this is a, um, a color relationship I've used in some of my work and uh, all these images came from the Camopedia blog. So it's definitely, um, and how sort of camouflage and, and camouflage and the theater of war was sort of interpreted differently in, in different countries. Um, but if we get back to Dazzle Camouflage, which essentially every artist who looks at this picture loves it so much they're like I have to do a project about dazzle camouflage like it's just you know there's a quote from Picasso I should have found that he said these dazzle camouflage ships are are uh, you know the best and biggest canvas that's happening in contemporary art and it's a movement that was aligned um, more with World War One than World War Two. And it's kind of interesting. Um, the idea of dazzle camouflage is it's like, um, it's not trying to hide the ship. So it's not like a battleship gray ship, which apparently battleship gray only hides two times a day, like twilight and you know early in the morning. The other times, even battleship gray ship, you can see it. Um, so this idea was like, you would almost like superimpose a 2D pattern of a 3D ship going in a different direction so that the enemy torpedoer who had to send out a charge would sort of miscalculate because they had to calculate which direction the ship was going and how fast because their torpedoes were not fast. And the idea was sort of like to confuse perception. Um, so it's really a very interesting phenomenon. Apparently the different countries had different ideas about dazzle cam camouflage. Like sometimes ships were camouflaged in America and they went to Britain and they got like repainted. Um, there are a lot of uh, women that were involved in this war effort of painting ships. And it's it's really kind of a cool history to read about fully unproven, sort of quasi-scientific. And um, I wish I could find this like amazing image I saw once of two like white scientists with like glasses on and they were looking at a little diorama and they had like little ships in the water and they were dazzle camouflaged and they were doing like a scientific study of the effic efficacy of the dazzle pattern. And I can't find that image, but I did have a um, an artist residency once at Banff. And uh, that was another place where I had to sort of pretend I was a visual artist and not a jeweler. And when you have a residency they, there, they make you propose what you're going to do before you arrive. So I said, I am going to embark upon a scientific study of um, how form, how three-dimensional forms are affected by two-dimensional color and pattern. And I proposed that I would build a library of um, cardboard objects. I would gesso them and then I would paint them. And just like those scientists, I would try out the objects and various landscapes to see how we perceive the form, like how color and pattern changes our perception of form. So I built these objects and then I had so much fun painting with tape. I don't know if anyone's ever done this where you put like the painter's tape on object, you release it. Um, so I just sat in this little studio and <laughs> created a library of dazzle camouflaged shapes. And I also had access to uh, printmaking there. So I um, I did some monotypes with just like colored backgrounds. I worked pretty intuitively. And my idea was that eventually the object, the 3D objects would um, inter interact with these 2D planes. So I'll go kind of quickly through, um, I 
kind of set up a, a photography, a photo shoot, and I just photograph the objects in, in different backgrounds. And had a lot of fun with that. Um, so those shots kind of showed you the setup and then these are absolutely not um, photoshopped at all. They're just cropped, you know, so I just cropped the, the setting out. And I just really like that they feel kind of abstract. They feel a little bit between digital and sort of handcrafted. Um, you can't tell exactly, I guess you can't tell exactly what they are or maybe even somebody made them. And I just like that play between the 2D, 3D and um, being able to play with unexpected patterns. So these are all, yeah, the 2D objects and the 3D backgrounds. And these we're going to put on hold for a little minute. They're going to come back. Um, I just want to share a little bit of uh, um, uh, like a sort of context for some of the works of adornment that I make because I am a jeweler. So this particular object here, um, I also found at um, a vintage store, a thrift store, and it's sort of like pieces of wood that are hand carved and interlocked. And um, I found out later through, that it's called a um, crown of thorns and they were often used as uh, picture frames. So, you know, back in the day, you might have like one good picture and this was like a hand carved hobby project that seemed to have like no beginning and no end. And um, I purchased this and I took it apart and I sort of understood the way the patterns of threes uh, interlocked with each other. And uh, this this pattern um, I've been kind of exploring for a number of years now. And uh, I had another residency where our laser cutters. So um, nest on larger pieces of the Formica laminate and just have like a lot of modular elements. Um, I was able to get um, larger, more expressive, a little bit more complicated with the designs that I was making. And um, this was just a, this was a really amazing time. So I had three months in uh, San Francisco. And uh, for the, these pieces here are all cut in cardboard. So you know, with, with access to that tool, essentially like day and night, I was able to uh, do different iterations of that initial form that I found. Um, so yeah, so I always do those things first in cardboard and then eventually uh, I make them in Formica laminate. This is a little stop motion that I made that, um, this is like something like four or five hours compressed into 20 seconds. So I just was sort of playing around. This shows the, the process and of making and the kind of color families and um, I guess sort of like the analog uh, combined with the digital. Um, the, so in addition to making my work, um, I've become more and more interested in how to photograph it and how to present it. Um, in my field, this is kind of the normal for sharing jewelry. It's pretty boring. It's like a white background. It's the same as the white cube for displaying paintings or displaying a three-dimensional work. So the focus is completely on the object. So that's understandable. Um, but as time goes on, that's not really that fun for me. Like I know, it's kind of like I know about making the objects now and I love to see what else can happen with them. Like what other sort of vibrations or context or 
um, different kind of perceptions can happen. So I've been kind of exploring different ways to uh, present my work. And I had a show at Gallery Noel Guillomar in Montreal a couple years ago. And I, this was sort of the beginning. So I just took the prints that I made in Banff and I just, he allowed me to like set up a really long table and I just put the uh, jewelry right on the prints to kind of start to have some vibrations and interaction with that color. This was another residency that, that I had in Haystack, Maine. Um, so this is just a two week residency. And if there's any artists um, listening today, uh, they have this artist residency every summer for professional artists. It's two weeks and it's for. So it's really a great one. Um, I also made a proposal for this one and I was like, I'm going to bring seven shirts with crazy patterns on them and I'm going to make brooches that camouflage or conceal into these pattern shirts as much as possible and then I'm also going to make exactly the opposite I'm going to make brooches that pop out from this pattern absolutely as much as possible so I brought um, the the kind of wooden shapes I had brought those and I just brought like some very low tech like testers paint or like acrylic paint. So these are just little stickers and uh, you know, they have nice pin backs, but they're just made from wood and paint. And this was a brooch I painted. So that goes on to that shirt that I also brought. And then uh, Haystack's really about sharing. So there was a pho photographer there who's like, I'll photograph your works for you. And um, so these are just different pieces. This was not a shirt I brought. Um, this woman was like, what, why are you? She's like, you should make brooches for everybody here not just the shirts you you brought. So, you know, make one for me. So I did that. And uh, this was back to a shirt I brought. So I have no idea why this brooch is so big. Um, so that was the one that, this is just all hand painted or like painted with tape. And then this next brooch is like, essentially the complement of every single color in the same pattern so that this would be a brooch that would conceal and reveal as much as possible. Yep, so a couple of those pictures there. And so just everything hand painted acrylic and wood. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this low tech approach. And I I wore this jacket to dinner one night with the brooch. And I still remember someone came up to me and was like, you know, that brooch you're wearing really goes with that jacket. I was like, yeah, it really does. <laughs> so um, that was just like, you know, these are all almost like short color research projects. So then I still very interested in perception of like color and pattern and form and uh, different ways to display the jewelry. So I applied for an exhibition in uh, the Mary Black Gallery, which is in Halifax. And it's kind of like, I already know how to make jewelry, but I don't know how to make a big colored environment. So that's what I proposed. Um, I designed this wall wrap that, um, completely covered the gallery on all sides. And if you look at the wall wrap, I actually pulled the um, cardboard objects that I made from Banff. So I sort of like flattened those in Illustrator or Photoshop and like superimposed them like to design this really very long and expensive vinyl wrap. Um, you'll see there's like the coral snake color pattern there and there's some colorful dazzle camouflage and and things like that that was really a labor of love to pull that that work and i put them all out on tables and i had the fun of finding the place for each piece so just my works were installed directly on the wall and uh, you know everything was just like like vibrating like being able to see color and like form in like a new way and uh, again these are sort of the exploded like cardboard shapes from before 
So in addition to installing the works in the um, gallery, I proposed a couple things during the run of that show. Like we had a special dinner with handmade ceramics and colored food. And uh, we also had a Mary Black Dazzle Camouflage Night where um, an emerging artist, an emerging photographer came and uh, uh, Emily Lawrence like styled everybody. She like brought wigs and had made um, sort of clothing. And then people were invited to take the jewelry off the wall and uh, wear it. And Seamus Gallagher did all the photography. Um, so we just had a huge amount of fun, like sort of activating the space beyond the opening night. Um, other things that I've been up to, um, COVID happened and I was inside time. Uh, yeah, I didn't have to my traditional jewelry studio. So um, I know some people baked bread and did other things. I got into natural dyeing. So um, just every avocado pit for two years was saved because that makes like a a beautiful like I think it's called millennial pink the avocado pits and you know I saved like the inside of birch bark and um, collected dandelions learned about mordants and uh, even like how our copper pots versus our iron pots will cause different reactions and you know it was funny because at the end I had laundry baskets full of like colored um fabric and journals and at the end of it my husband's well said well you know um if I need to find a brown dye I'll I'll you know come ask you because like all of these I guess are like a little bit like iterations of brown um but like a little bit different brown so um I had all these like fabrics for a long time and uh um Last year, I worked with a studio assistant who was good at sewing, and I was like, we have to make these natural dyed fabrics into something. And I was really interested in uh, making adornment that was like kind of between clothing and jewelry, like I wanted to be able to put it on and really not feel it. And um, so I'm still in the middle of this exploration, sort of like seeing how far I can push and pull between those two worlds. I also did uh, a project with a um, Carol Sinclair, who's a ceramicist from Scotland. So I was part of this exchange um, project um, between the two countries called Shift, and it was like seven makers from and seven makers from Nova Scotia, and we were going to this exchange over one year, but because of COVID, it actually lasted three years, and uh, we had it was actually really nice. We had like regular Friday video chats and I always got to hear how COVID was like affecting Europe because it ev eventually affected North America in the same way. Um, so Cara Carol and I remotely made this set of wings like she made the left wing and I made the right wing and uh, I again just again I'm like seeing one next to another color is why I do all of this you know I grab all these laser cutting scraps or natural dyed fabric or ceramic. And, um, you know, we agreed on a pattern and that way we could in different countries make all the feathers. And then it got um, exhibited in a couple places in Scotland and it will come to Canada next year, I think. Um, let's see if this little video plays. This was a show I installed in Boston last November. No time to get into this, but this was whole set of watercolor paintings I did and then the jewelry that sort of resulted so the watercolors I started during COVID as like sort of a low-tech way to um, stay creative while I didn't have access to my studio and I let that inform some uh, new works of art um, that I was designing and this was one of the pieces so this is a big piece of wood with acrylic um, paint and a vintage silk obi sash. Um, these are, I've kind of started um, a project exploring the Harlequin pattern. And this was, I made some of these wooden beads and just hand painted them with testers oil paint. And I've also been exploring color. There's a way to 
um, use colored pencil on metal if you like gesso it and do a bunch of layers of colored pencil and uh, shellac them and wax them it's really a resilient um, finish so um, this is metal work with colored pencil um, and this is what I'm still exploring right now so I'm um, yeah I've I've always kind of abstractly been interested in the Harlequin pattern. Sarah, that's the name of the necklace that you wear too. And the more I've started to look into that, it's part of like the history of a Italian comedic theater. And um, the Harlequin pattern is so bold and uh, so recognizable, but they also call it a mask. Like, like the Harlequin wears a mask of color. And I think that's kind of cool to like hide behind something that's very colorful. Um, so anyway, I'm telling you all that because I'm always interested in collaboration and people who are, are like-minded or share similar research interests. So if any of that interests you, I would love to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. That was fantastic. Just chock full of wonderful thoughts and ideas and images. Um, I think we've got a, a nice little chunk of time. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions or or comments or things they want to kind of unpick farther or see again. And um, Sarah, should I stop sharing my screen now so everybody becomes big? Sure. Why not? Why not? Okay. Yes, and, and maybe I know some people would prefer not to do this, but if you feel comfortable opening up your camera do most many of us know what it's like to speak to a, a set of black boxes so if you if you feel comfortable opening up your camera uh i think uh, uh i think rebecca would appreciate it i i certainly would oh it's my first time seeing who's here hi everybody <laughs> thanks for coming <laughs> rebecca I, I have to leave shortly but i wanted to ask you a question and it was i just want to say it was really great to Hear you talk about your work and also just to see the arc of your work um i the uh there was a there's been a, a there was a change that sort of i i sort of felt like where there was a kind of industrial um uh more sort of flat uniform finish on things and now, and now you're using, you're doing these, like the, almost, they almost feel like paintings, the, the, well, they, they are paintings and drawings as on objects. And, uh, and so there's a, you know, there's a process that you kind of, you just sort of said, well, I'm doing, I'm exploring this and I'm exploring that. But what, what led you, cause they, they, they look formally very different from one another. And I'm just interested to hear you. I love them both. I just, I want, I just um, interested to hear how you uh, sort of moved from, you know, like very sort of resolved formal things to things that are a little bit more open ended and even sort of scrappy feeling. Like, yeah. Anyway, that I just want to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. I guess. It's hard to put my finger on, I kind of think um, like the years I lived in New York City, I used to wear all black, like everybody. And then one day it just struck me, this is making nobody happy. And just for one day, the next, I just switched and I just was like lots of color. And I think um, if you think about, if you're a goldsmith or a jeweler or a metalsmith, um, in terms of color, it's pretty limiting, right? We have silver, gold, brass, copper, and like black patina on metal. So it's basically like white, gold, and black. That's the range. And mm -hmm. I guess you can throw in gemstones, which I don't use that much. Um, so I think I really, I explored that. I kind of hit all the parameters of that. And then I honestly just like missed the color. Um, so that's why I started incorporating more non-traditional materials and plastics. And the kind of more scrappy low tech stuff now, I don't know if that came out of COVID or like jewelry takes lots and lots of planning. It's very like premeditated and 
I just taught all day and like the students like, ah, this takes so long. It's so much math. I'm like, yeah. So maybe I hit that wall too. And uh, I kind of like know how to make traditional jewelry as much as I want to. And then I was interested in what else sort of more intuitive or more um, like spontaneous, like what could be more spontaneous with jewelry. So when I do like the very last colored pencil pieces, it still takes time to do like the metal part, like to do the pin back and things. But then it's like, I'm setting myself up for the fun. And the fun is kind of what you painters get to have like all the time. <laughs> Thanks, that's great. I think if you have a question, just jump in. I'll, I'll okay. Um, my eyes I, for I'd hands like up. to ask a few things or just mention a few things. Uh, my name is Laura Roy. I'm an artist in Halifax. And I met you, Rebecca, years ago, probably like 15-ish years ago, because I was at NASCAD uh, about from 2007 to 2012, and then again from 2014 to 2016. Um, I have a studio in the Blue Building, but I was just... Wondering if you, if everybody has um, listened to or read Gretchen Rubin's uh, books or colors, she's really fat. This is her new book. I, I put it, I put the, um, the, I put it in the chat, um, but there's a whole chapter on color. Um, and uh, she talks about how if you put your phone on black and white, it will not only help you with your headaches, but it'll make everything in your world look more vivid and it really does like both of those things for me anyway but uh so now my computer's still on color but my phone's in black and white and it's made a huge difference but definitely recommend that and i also posted i i, I put on the chat the link to um her most recent like interview about it um which is kind of interesting it's it's one of those things you could just listen to driving or like it's, it's just, it's quite the, the person who hosts that does really interesting people, but she, uh, she's definitely worth a listen to for sure. But no, I'd love to, um, I do a lot of big textile work, um, big embroideries and stuff. I have built a, a, a studio at the blue building, but, uh, it's really interesting to see like the different, like you, have such interesting color combinations and I'm really trying to work with that with like um, digital and I'm doing a lot of digital drawings but I'm getting it printed on fabric right now mm -hmm. and so I'm it, it's interesting to see what other people are doing because when you grab after you graduate you don't get as much um, chat right with everybody else or with other artists so well, thanks so much, Laura. Like, let's do a studio visit. Definitely. I'm at the Blue Building upstairs, and I think Jessica Winton might be on this chat too, but she's also down the hall from me too. Yeah, Peter, you have a comment. I think Rose did as yeah. well. So maybe Rose and then Peter? Okay, Rebecca, I wanted to tell you a color story from my life today. Hi, um, my house is a clay house set back. I like to call it clay set back from the street. And my neighbor's house is sage green. And she had it, she's having it painted today. And she's having it painted lime green, the brightest Ooh. lime green I've seen in my life. Anyway, I've been playing with color theory all day and testing my eyes. And of course, because the brilliance is so much, um, I turned my house and all of a sudden it's not dark clay, it's bright orange. And that's because oh. of the saturation and the brilliance of her color and how I'm perceiving the compliment now. And it's driving me crazy. I like my dark clay house, not my bright orange house. I know you're going to have to <laughs> like turn your really phone to good. black and white to like wash <laughs> that out that's of your Cones but rock. it's a, a total example, I realized today, of color theory. If you know just a little bit about it, then how your eyes really uh, change and modify when you look at, at different things. Yeah. And you know the, the so sad that part. was in my, yeah, sorry, Sarah. I, I was yeah. just going to say the sad part is that woman, she thought her house was going to be blue, but your, your clay colored house has made her blue house go lime <laughs> green. 
<laughs> well, and it makes me think of this couch when I ordered this couch. I thought I had ordered gray. And then when I got it in my house, it was kind of like this blue, green, gray. And I'm like, it actually worked out really well because it, it matched the chair that I have. But it was really funny how like when you're in a store, a color might look completely different than if it's in your house or like vice versa, right? So. Well, it reminds me of another story when I was having my house painted, trim painted white, and it's a very creamy white. And this guy was highly recommended as a painter and he came in and he said, and I said, well, I'm not sure what white I want exactly. And he said, well, white's white. And I went, oh my God, he's not painting my house. There's <laughs> white, there's cool white, there's rose white, there's purple white. Like, no way are you oh, painting. <laughs> white is stressful to go by. So now I just go by cloud white if I need something for a trim because in the house, because I know that's what I've used in this, in this place. And it's just after that, after you look at like, 50 shades of white you're just like oh god but anyway look at what your uh your lecture has prompted rebecca <laughs> you know all kinds of discussions about color and and really how it does affect us right every day in life that we don't really realize or recognize i think yeah anyway thank you it was a wonderful talk thank yeah. you i have a question rebecca with your um three-dimensional placement of your work on two dimensions, I noticed um, some shadows starting to happen. And I wondered if you ever played with shadows, how color influences shadows. Is that anything that you've ever considered so far? I have not. <laughs> but if you are seeing that, because that's like more subtlety so if you're seeing that I'm gonna go back and look at the images because I didn't even think of that you could yeah or and or like do you ever work with transparent materials no I know we need oh sorry I know Peter had a, a question but just to very quickly follow up from what Robin was saying, I was thinking about the, the very same thing, the complexity of working with three dimensionality, because you showed a brooch, I think it was one of the brooches based on the crown of thorns, and you showed it right after the jacket with the, where you got the comment, oh, that brooch matches that jacket really well. The very next image was of a, a crown of uh, thorn, I think it was a crown of thorns brooch, and there was a, a pink cutout shape and at the top where it was in mostly in light it was quite pink and at the bottom where it was in shadow it was a kind of a coral a coral brown color and it made me you know a painter I'm working for the most part with things that are completely flat and don't change I mean they change according to the color of the light they're in but the, mm -hmm. they, they're not moving around continuously but it struck me as a jeweler you're working with things that are always being affected by the curve of a body or the, like a three-dimensional shape that might affect the color of a flat surface um like like your crown like your crown of thorns uh jewels you know some of those planes are in light some of those planes are in shadow and so the color changes um, yeah because we have jewelry and then we have clothing and then we have the context like the environment so we yeah. have you know almost three things we can play with yeah peter you had a question or a comment You gotta turn I, your mic on. All right, live now. Um, probably a historical anecdote that's hilarious. And thank you, Rebecca, for sharing everything. But from one dazzle ship nerd to another. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why Dazzle never really worked was all the graphic representations we have are all of the color patterns and the ships are at still beside each other. But these uh, ships were powered by coal fired steamship engines and they belched a heck of a lot of black smoke. And the submariners on the other side figured out pretty quickly which direction they were going and at what speed. 
<laughs> so all the coloration and stuff aside, that was the core. There's absolutely no evidence that this actually helped. It was like the black smoke belching out of the pipes. But, but like they went for it, even though it was like totally yeah. unproven, like they went for yeah. it. <laughs> Again, back to your Picasso and Gertrude Stein quote about, you know, the cubists having invented somehow camouflage. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question in the chat from Jessica. Jessica, you want to just spit it out? You may also be muted. Hi. Um I guess, Rebecca, I was just knowing, you know, sometimes you sell your work to people and they purchase it to wear for themselves. I was wondering if you had noticed any uh, relationship between the colorways of things that you sell to folks and their personalities um, or like the scenario that you're selling them in, like, you know, during politically turbulent times, are the bright, the brightest pieces uh, of most interest, or you know, uh, I, I was just wondering if you had any uh, noticed any relationship with with that. That's an interesting question, Jessica. I guess I haven't noticed color relationships with particular people. Um, I do know most people like would not wear my work or buy it like I mean the like some of the bigger almost like Elizabethan collar like most people are like oh that's kind of big but some people do you know I have sold some of them and I sometimes know a little bit about the people that buy them and I do like to imagine those pieces going out in the world like there's a woman I follow on Instagram who's uh, 93 and she like posts her age every day I'm 93 and she wears like totally crazy like uh, couture clothing she's always going to art events and then she'll tag me sometimes because she has some of my jewelry and that makes me really happy like what she's chosen and that she's like fashionable at any age um, if I could multitask I could put her in I think it's like Corrine Warner 40 or 50. Um, so, but, you know, the thing I am thinking about more now with like the Harlequin pattern and that like people wear bright clothing or bright adornment as sort of um, like a mask, like when you wear it, actually everybody's going to talk about the jewelry like it is attention getting, but then you don't have to talk about yourself. Like, I don't have to say, oh, this is my job or I live here. You can just talk about like the crazy thing you're wearing. So that is what is kind of interesting that bright color and bold form can like conceal who you are in a way if you're brave enough to wear it, which I hope you are. Okay. Yeah, I have a shirt that I call the distraction factor because um, mm -hmm. it's just like dazzle camouflage. And uh, it always makes me f um, feel like, well, I just it is one of those shirts that's kind of uh, see, finds so much attention that um, it distracts from whatever is not going well with your hair or anything else like that. <laughs> so. <Love> that. <laughs> Yeah. The, the other th I'm not seeing any other questions, but the other thoughts just suddenly occurred to me. I was thinking about Matthew's um, comment and question about the shift from working with sort of industrial um, materials like the like the like the plexi's coming to mind. I know it's not plexi, the formica. Mm -hmm. um, versus what you're doing now with painting. And one of the things that um, strikes me is that with the Formica, of course you can choose the combinations, but in some ways the chips are the chips and um, you've got a big range of color with them, but you can't mix a color. 
So you, you just deal with what's already there. What, as soon as you start painting, you can choose, well, not this blue, just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit different of a blue. And uh, that, anyway, I wonder if you could talk about it because that's such a different relationship to working with color and color relationships. Um, I guess one way I can think about that is people who've chosen to be a jeweler, like myself, we like parameters. You know, we like the limitation of when you're a traditional jeweler, it's like sheet and wire. And what are you going to make out of that? It's like different size wire, different size sheet, but like everything in our whole vocabulary is made from that. And I know for a lot of years, I would be in different you know, art summer camps or art jobs or residencies where there was always a clay studio and I was always right next to it. And I like didn't go there because it just seemed like clay was like too squishy. Like there wasn't enough resistance. There wasn't enough parameter. And um, in recent years, I am in interested in clay. Like I finally touched it. I'm like, oh, this material is so forgiving. Like you can just start again. You just, it's like nothing, you can't start it or again in jewelry. <laughs> like when you've gone down that pathway, you just grab some more metal and, and do it a second time. So I, I think, yeah, it's just that like openness that sort of has come with time that I, needed to develop my vocabulary and that more industrial like limited but then almost like having a canvas like now I can choose to break out of that like even with the that very last slide of like the harlequin earrings and the different colored pattern I just discovered that there's gesso of different colors like Sarah you didn't tell me that I just we made or like rabbit skin glued gesso and this gesso and that it was always white. And I went to like uh, a store in New York in summer and there was like all the colors. So I bought it because I'm like, ooh, what if a little bit of like green or brown gesso shows through and like it does. And it's like so exciting again. And uh, that is, I, I don't know if colored pencil and paint and things solution for jewelry like it it's not as durable as gold and metal but um it feels like the right thing right now to kind of do that color exploration that you're talking about yeah yeah is there any other comments or questions that uh that anyone is burning to ask rebecca well i'm not seeing anything i'll just quickly check the chat but no i don't see anything there so I guess it just remains to say two things. One is thank you so much for attending this talk. It's the Color Research Society of Canada. Our next talk is unclear because the speaker recently um, uh, uh, ha ha was incapacitated because of, anyway, was incapacitated. So it's unclear, but it, it could well be in October. It'll be posted on the Color Research Society of Canada's uh, website. So it yeah, encourage... I think at the moment we're sticking with it. The speaker might switch. So um, it's actually two versions of the same talk, November 15th and 16th, the 2024 Color Trend Report by um, uh, Sherwin-Williams consultant. At the moment, it's one of our board members, but it might swap out. So that's our next event, our next Kaleidoscope talk. Um, and then our members event is December 7th, the book club, All the Color in the World by C.S. Richardson. And uh, he will actually be uh, coming to the book club, which is amazing. He's just been shortlisted for the Giller. And then stay tuned to our website for talks next term. We have more artists speaking. We have scientists. Um, Udo, who is here tonight. Yes, Udo's here. He's going to be speaking as our keynote speaker for our AGM in March. So uh, color and uh, building design. So please, uh, yes, join us uh, if you can. You're welcome to come to the talks. We would love to have you as a member. And please, once again, let's thank Rebecca for a fabulous and intriguing talk. And uh, your work is just so amazing to look at and so inspiring. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you.
to all old friends, family, everybody who came. I'm so happy to see you guys here. Thanks. And thanks for the opportunity, Robin, Sarah. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks.